Thank you. Very good. So, as I was saying, you're definitely in the right place this afternoon because um, crop circles are an idea that have captured the popular imagination and Rob has spent many years looking into the subject and talking to the people who are closest to the heart of it. So we're in for a, um, a rare combination of inside information on crop circles and genuine dying breed of investigative journalism. Rob Buckle, ladies and gentlemen. All Thanks, right. Rob. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Right, afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Right, okay, well, can you hear me at the back? Okay, I'll try and project to the back. If you can't hear, just wave or something. But um, I'm used to projecting, so uh, I'll try and keep it at that volume. Is that okay? Right, so, from crop circles to pyramids, reconnecting human potential. Uh, so, crop circles is uh, something that I've become perhaps a little bit more known for than anything else. Although this, this talk is not just to do with crop circles. There is other elements to it as well, but all of it has stemmed from my initial research into crop circles. So, we'll get, get cracking with that. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Some of you might know me already from uh, YouTube. Some of you might know me from uh, Truth Juice. But uh, I started looking at crop circles probably way back in the 80s originally. And uh, that developed into me making some videos. And I started to look at it in, in much more detail and looking at all the different as aspects of that, the different viewpoints. And my view has changed quite a lot over the years. So it's evolved, I would say, you know, down to the, from the uh, evidence that I've found. So all, all the things that I'm presenting on this are not just based on me making up a theory on this. It's, it's based on detailed research over a number of years and, and talking to people at the heart of the, the whole mystery. Okay, so these are a couple of the videos that you may find online if you want to find out more information about myself and my uh, my views on this on the subject people call me a crop circle researcher that's not officially what uh, I am I'm, I'm certainly not paid to research this by anybody some people think I'm a government agent and uh, in this kind of thing I've been called um, a, a disinfo agent all kinds of stuff uh, but you'll find as we go through the, the, this whole topic is it's quite a hotbed of political, char politically charged views, and there's so much um, venom in, in and around the subject. It's, it's quite unbelievable. Some people can't quite comprehend what how that is the case, but uh, I can assure you that uh, not everybody in the crop circle world is full of love and light, uh, and I've experienced. Uh, you know both sides of it there's some very great people involved in that in the research of this but there's a lot of people with their own agendas as well this is just a little bit about me again this is what I actually do I don't know if you can see that I'm a holistic therapist and hypnotherapist I do Reiki reflexology hypnotherapy and uh, well actually from uh, as of this week that is my full-time profession now Okay, so that's just a little bit of background to me. So, where I've come with this is to start looking at the crop circle phenomena from a different point of view. And one of the questions I'm asking now is, is there a unifying consciousness behind some of the world's most enduring mysteries, including crop circles? And I'm finding that common themes are cropping up in in all aspects of research into mysteries, ancient mysteries in particular. And there are key strands in that, that uh, they all have in common. One of those is spirit energy, and we're going to look at that and how that taps in shortly. The other one is earth energy, very important to so many of these uh, mysteries. And the third one is human energy. And that's the one that often gets overlooked, and we'll, we'll cover that in detail as well later on. 
This is a quote from Colin Andrews, who's of the same view of me on crop circles. We have very similar kind of ideas <laughs> on this. Um, as, he, as he says in the quote here, more than a paradigm shift, human consciousness is engaged in the process of integration with a higher mind. This process is occurring through encounters with non-ordinary reality that are known as high strangeness events. And we'll certainly learn a little bit more about some of these high strangeness events as we go through. And from this higher mind that he talks about here, what I would refer that to is, is more of a higher consciousness, something that we're all part of. And uh, there's a few quotes here that sort of reinforce that, that it's, it's not just my view on this, it's not just Colin Andrews. This is a view that's been going through for a long time. There is a force in the universe which, if we permit it, will throw, flow through us and produce magical results. That was said by Mahatma Gandhi. The day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. That was Nikola Tesla. So these guys were well ahead of the game with that, knowing that there's something else we should be looking at here. And this is a more recent quote. Every human being is equally powerful in their ability to shape the planet. His power was taken away from us. The evolution we are experiencing now is to recover that power. And that's where I think we are now. We are aware that there is this power, this energy going on that we need to tap into. And we, it's been taken away from us. But we, now we're in a position where we need to start doing things to recover that. That was Bruce Lipton author of Biology of Belief. So I would ask this question. <coughs> Have major scientific establishments been involved in a conspiracy to keep the truth about how powerful we really are? Yes! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we are powerful beings and um, this is really what we need to start looking at. This chap, Professor Hans Eisen, I think 19, 1957 claimed that there was a major conspiracy involving over 30 universities from around the world and hundreds of respected scientists to keep the truth about our true potential, the true potential of human consciousness from the public. So that was 1957, so that, that this was aware, but it's all been kept down, that kind of thing. So I would ask, has the greatest trick of all been to tell us that our minds are not powerful? And it is a lie. I mean, like um, I was saying before, I've worked with things like Reiki and hypnotherapy, and I've ex I can say from first-hand experience that we are powerful beings. If anybody's experienced hypnotherapy, you can realize just by an altered state of mind, you can do amazing things. And I don't mean just the kind of things that you see on TV, but I mean changing your life kind of things with just a few simple uh, sessions on that, using the right words, the right kind of terminology, the right way of working with an individual, magical things can happen. And, uh, and Reiki energy, uh, there's a, I'm sure there's a few people here that have experienced that or practitioners in that, that you can transmit energy from one person to another. You can even transmit energy through time and space. It's an amazing thing and we're not taught about these things. I'm just, before we look at crop circles, I'm going to look at something else that's linked to that. And this is where I started to really put it all together with, when by looking at this experiment. Um, the Skoll experiment was, was from 1993 it started, ran for about five years, and um, this was an experiment uh, apparently initiated by the spirits themselves through an established psychic circle in Norfolk. And it was a, quite an incredible thing. Has anybody heard of this experiment? Yeah. Well, it's surprising that more people haven't heard of this because it, is, it was quite a phenomenal thing. People say, well, there's no evidence for um, life after death. There's no evidence for uh, ghosts or spirit manifestations, this kind of thing. 
where's the evidence? There was tons of evidence produced here, but we, we very rarely hear about it. 100 hours of spirit contact was recorded over this time. A thousand hours, I should say. <coughs> recordings of voices and tape recordings with no microphones, TVs, with no aerials, all were picking up these, these things. And there were many documented cases of materialization and dematerialization of objects. They had about 70 different objects just material, materialized out of thin air and dematerialized back again some, in some occasions. Images were imprinted on sealed photographic equipment, photographic film, where they hadn't been tampered with. The film would have been left on a table while this seance was in progress and they open it up and it's full of images. Those images that you see there were of that type. They just found them on these undeveloped film. And physical contact as well. They've actually had manifestations of physical beings, entities, and had physical contact. And that's, that's quite rare in this kind of field. But they had a number of documented cases where that was the case. Now, the researchers in there, there was a number of different researchers involved in this, and they had scientists, recognized scientists involved, to monitor that this was all being uh, undertaken above board, there was no trickery going on, and um, nobody could find any, any fault with this. Uh, they could certainly have found no evidence of trickery, and um, the, some of the psychics tried to communicate with the with the spirit entities and we're asking them how do they manage to do this how is it happening and this is quite a revealing thing the spirits claimed such communication works through a subtle blend of spirit earth and human energy and you'll see that theme coming up again which combined to form a new creative energy now that's I, I think a very significant <coughs> statement and even its effectiveness depended on the specific combination of energies of the people participating. So it was a very subtle blend of energies, and the balance had to be right. Uh, so it may have been, oh, this would have only happened if certain individuals were involved in it, and a certain number of individuals and certain places that it happened in. So the conditions had to be right for this to happen. But it certainly did make a difference. And as they continue with that, these energies were understood and used by our, the ancients. But this is now forgotten knowledge. We are trying to help humanity remember. Okay, we'll, we're returning to that theme as well. This forgotten knowledge that we have this ability to do this, to connect with the spirit realm. And we're connecting through a combination of the earth and human energy to do that. So we'll, we'll explore that as we go through. But I thought that was very significant. And when I, when I first read that, it was actually in Colin Andrews' book, um, his latest book, that I came across that. And uh, immediately my mind went to crop circles in terms of how this links in with that. And you'll see as we go through how it does link in. Now, balls of light and orbs. This is a very interesting area. And um, a lot of people have seen these. I'm sure many of you here have picked up images of orbs or balls of light on photographic images. Do you know this kind of thing I'm talking about? Yeah, you can um, very often see them on um, digital uh, images. But there are different types of balls of light and orbs, and I'll go through some of those as we go through. But I. I think this is a, a, a link in with the spirit world. So this is just a, a picture. I don't know if you can see that clearly there, can you? There's, um, that's me there on the, on the left, and a couple of uh, friends of mine. This is at the Roll Wright Stones in Oxfordshire. And uh, we just posed for this picture. This was on um, the winter solstice 2012. And uh, we posed for this picture. And then we looked at back at it, and there was like, three orbs directly above us and what we thought was interesting is that you notice our heights go up like that I was the shortest there and the, two, the other two guys are quite tall Dom's about uh, six foot five 
and uh, we sort of formed a little line there and these uh, these orbs that came above forms a similar corresponding line so that I was interested in that um, the, the interaction that you get with these kind of things even on that kind of thing and there's if you notice there's actually another little image another orb there and I thought well that maybe doesn't fit but then I remembered well there was a photographer as well and they were positioned in that position <laughs> so um, I, th I thought that was quite a nice uh, picture there so just moving on to that um, night watching is something I, I've I've done a fair amount of in mostly in the in the Wiltshire area Wiltshire as many of you may know is the center of crop circle activity it's not the only place crop circles uh, appear but it's the like the epicenter if you like where the vast majority appear and uh, one of the reasons for that I would argue is that there is such so much unusual phenomenon in that area it's um, it's not linked necessarily to the crop circles although we'll come on to how it does link in shortly it's something that's been in that area for it seems like forever it's um, people for, for many many years have been reporting sightings of unusual phenomena particularly balls of light and a few of us have gone out on these night watching excursions and gone to places uh, you know of um, historical significance we're sta actually standing there on West Kennet Long Barrow and um, we conducted a, a night watch from that place and on, on such occasions one, on one occasion in particular we witnessed um, four separate appearances of balls of light and these things were not like the ones you get in the pictures in the photographs these were f more physical I couldn't tell you if they were actual physical things or not whether you could touch them because we didn't get close enough but you could see these things I would estimate they were probably more like football size and uh, on a couple of occasions they rose up from the ground we saw them lift off from the ground and then would hover in the air at probably about a mile away from us where we were watching but making it very clear to us that they were there they would just rise up move around a bit almost as if to just attract attention to themselves and then gently drop down again and uh, we actually had some night vision binoculars and we were watching these things through the binoculars and you could see through the trees you could see the shape of this this ball of light and you could even see it morphing into other shapes and things flying off it and all kinds of weird things going on and we also saw one coming uh, in the sky look like an aeroplane we thought it was an aeroplane high up in the sky coming towards us we just watched this thing thinking you know is it a plane is it a helicopter and then suddenly it shot down dropped out of the sky uh, and then stopped and oh no that's not a helicopter they don't do that and then it looped around in the you know in a circle and then uh, dropped down again and looped around again it was quite amazing to see uh, so what that was I've no idea in terms of you know whether that was a physical thing or whatever you, some people might describe it as a UFO but I would say it was a it was a ball of light and I'll uh, go into a little bit more detail now about what they perhaps are uh, this this is Silbury Hill in um, in Wiltshire center of a lot of activity over the years and while we were doing a night watch on one of these occasions there was a, a couple there who were on Silbury Hill in July 1994 and they recounted to me their experiences that they had on, on top of Silbury Hill they were, they were doing a night watch mostly because they were interested in crop circles at the time and also unusual phenomena and then they saw some balls of light approaching and came very close to the to the hill and there was a like a shroud of mist came over Silbury Hill and uh, but these balls of light kept coming and came very close to them and they could see them very clearly they seemed to be picking up even telepathic communication with them and um, then all of a sudden these balls of light turned around 
and transformed into these tetrahedral craft shapes. You can just about see them on, on there. You see those there? They turn into this craft shape with a being inside it. A being of light, as they call it. And uh, they had some telepathic communication with them. Um, and these whole events went on for a considerable uh, time. They estimated it was several hours that this was going on. There was about seven or eight people on Silver Hill at the time that witnessed all these events. And there was other things going on around Silver Hill as well that they witnessed. But then when, they, when it had all died down and finished, they realised only 25 minutes had passed and they couldn't work out how that was the case. But often time seems to be a, f a factor in a lot of these. There's warps of time. So that's why I think these balls of light and these beings associated with that are something to do with um, other dimensions. And uh, this is actually a, a close-up shot of, of what they saw. So this does seem to be um, beings associated with these balls of light. So as I say, this is like a, the different steps of that. You've got the, the more translucent ones, small ones that you'll see on the film, on the uh, photographic film. You've got the balls of light that I've seen, and you've got physical manifestations like this, all coming from the same phenomena. But Silbury Hill is the centre of a lot of uh, weird activity. Um, that's the place there. It's a magnificent thing. I mean, it's called a hill, but is it is it really a hill? <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, it's a sort of hill, but was that the idea, just to build a hill? Um, people have even described this as like a, a viewing point for a defence of some sort, but that makes no sense at all because... Silvery Hill, if you, if you go there, is actually lower down than the surrounding hills. But if you look at the shape of it, it's very definite, isn't it? It's very definite in terms of the, the, well, the circular base, and it goes up like a, a, a conical shape. But I think it has more in connection with the pyramid. If you look at these, that is Bosnia. Uh, the Bosnian pyramid, which is... Uh, something that uh, is becoming a little bit more known about has the same kind of appearance you see it there covered in grass and uh, there's the Great Pyramid of Giza there a lot of similarities I would say between Silvery Hill and Pyramids in terms of the structure and in terms of what they were trying to do with that there's Pyramids and the, the conical shapes of uh, like pin, uh, Silvery Hill all have spiral type energy uh, that's how the energy sort of works its way through there and um, I'm just wondering if they, the builders of Silvery Hill had that in mind they were trying to create a kind of a pyramid or at least having the effect of a pyramid not in terms of anything to do with burials or anything like that I don't believe that's what pyramids were designed for but because it harnesses energy and um, I would say that there's, there's, there's more to that uh, in the Wiltshire area because Wiltshire is a centre of a lot of energy and I would say it, it could well have something to do with portals which is an interesting idea. People look at me strange when I say things like that. Uh, <coughs> portals is like so there's something out of science fiction. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that portals exist in the Wiltshire area and elsewhere around the country and, and certainly around the world and um, in fact this is some evidence of that this is a plaque that you can see in a church in Alton Barnes in Wiltshire and it's something that's it, you, not many people know about unless you're sort of familiar with the, with the area and you visit there quite a lot uh, and it's only about that big it's uh, and positioned in this, this church and in fact, even that part of it's misleading. I heard that there's a plaque in, in, in Alton Barnes, and I went to look for it. And there's a church in Alton Barnes, which is signposted, the Saxon church, I think it is. And you go in there, and you think, where is it? I can't, I can't find it. And then there's a friend of mine that knew about this. He said, well, no, you're in the wrong church. <laughs> the actual church you want is 
you go out the gate, you go through that uh, fence, you go across that field, you go through another hedge, and there's the little church behind a, another hedge, tucked away somewhere. And so may, nobody visits, visits there unless you know about this. And, um, and this plaque is on the wall. And uh, the, the idea was that this guy, William Button, had located the, uh, the location of a portal in that area and there was pieces of stone that, that actually pinpointed where this was and, and these, these pieces of stone with the, with the hole buried in, I don't have the photograph here, um, it, it's like a, a, a viewing hole, you look through it like a telescopic view through it and it would pinpoint the location of this portal. And the, uh, and the details of the portal describe his experiences of that and it seems to be related to sun cycles and moon cycles and certain conditions that have to be right which would fit in with, with what I believe about this kind of thing it's not something that you can just get, walk up to and find oh, there's a portal and, and off we go it's, there's a bit more to it than that uh, and, and these stones actually are underneath the floorboards in this church and you can actually lift up the floorboards and see them which is a, so it's an interesting place so there is evidence of uh, like a portal in the Wiltshire area and I would say Silbury Hill is possibly one of those a marker point for some of this activity as are other historical sites in the area and I came across this book recently UFOs, and Portals and Gateways by Nigel Mortimer and um, he's a guy that spent a lot of time studying portals in particular. There's one portal in the Yorkshire area that he's very interested in uh, with a lot of uh, activity, what we might call paranormal activity, unusual phenomena going on around it. And uh, it's a fascinating book and uh, backs up a lot of what, uh, what I'm saying on this subject. And he suggests that there are at least 12 major portal sites around the world. So modern thinkers on the theory of interdimensional portals suggest these are located at certain points around the globe that power centres. And in turn, these points make up a crystalline grid of unseen energy lines that join together like a living network. Okay, so we're just starting to find out about these things now and how these energy points are all over the place and, and providing us with marker points as to um, portals into to other dimensions, other worlds. And um, this is something else he says here, the fact remains backed up by excellent evidence that some kind of supernatural phenomena takes place at or close to portal sites. This is without a shadow of a doubt. And if you read his book, his documents, lots of this kind of thing. Uh, he's had many experiences of entities and uh, weird experiences uh, in and around these portal sites. So I think this is a sign to us that this is something very important that we're starting to now rediscover. And if we're trying to find the mysteries of consciousness and expanding our consciousness and interacting with other consciousness around this world and in, within other um, dimensions we have to start looking at this uh, because clearly there's an interaction coming the other way from entities entering into this time and space but we're not we're at the moment unable to do it the other way so maybe that's something else to look at in the future John Keel knew about all this stuff in 1970 and uh, he, he wrote this book, Operation Trojan Horse, and it's a, it's a fantastic book. If you're interested in UFOs and alien contact, that kind of thing, read this because it will change your mind about what it's all about. Because he looks at it as a multi-dimensional thing rather than extraterrestrial. So he says this, The Earth is covered with windows into that other unseen world. Brilliant scholars and philosophers have clearly seen the truth for centuries but their truths were lost in the waves of organized belief. Nearly all those who have come to this understanding of the true phenomena have quietly abandoned the subject because they found it impossible to articulate their findings and make the incredible credible. 
they were rendered mute by the awesome and overwhelming realisation that man is merely a trifling part of something much bigger. So, yes, this is why you don't hear of it that much, because people have looked into it and have just been ridiculed and have been bullied out of the subject by people that hold other beliefs. And the crop circle world is actually very, very similar to that. Like I've experienced that. You go in with a slightly different view and you get, you know, kicked by the established researchers who say, no, that's not the way we do it. This is the established view. And you come in with a different view and it's not accepted. And many people, I'm sure, have been through the crop circle e experience and come to these kind of conclusions and have been bullied out of it. So I would ask this question, coming back to crop circles, are some crop circles opening up temporary portals? Now this is an interesting theory because you get so much activity happening around crop circles. Okay, And we've already talked about the Wiltshire area and how that seems to be the centre of portal activity, unusual phenomena. And a lot of it seems to intensify when crop circles appear. So let's just have a look at the crop circle world a little bit there. So let's remind ourselves how it all began. Going back to the early 80s. I don't know if anyone was following crop circles then. There wasn't that many people following it and taking a serious interest in it. But I can remember these days. But simple circles used to appear. Now we can say, oh yeah, anyone can do that. Make a simple circle uh, and a piece of land. It's not that complex. But <coughs> it, it absolutely baffled people at the time. And there was f weird phenomena happening around these things even then. And if you look at the one on the right, you can see it's not just a case of a circle being flattened there is a distinct flow to it yeah it's um and i'm not saying that's impossible to be done by people but it was a very interesting element now, if somebody else wanted to put a, a circle down they just put a circle down but it was a little bit more to it than that and um it captured people's imaginations and it started something uh so these simple circles is where it all began and i would say there's many of these that are, are the biggest mystery of the whole subject. Everyone focuses on the big, spectacular ones, uh, but we'll look at those in a short while as well. But these s simple ones that will just appear for no apparent reason in any particular place, a random place, that had a, an air of strangeness about it that made people start to question what's going on. Who's doing this? Why? What's doing this? Why? So, the simple circle. This is what it represents in terms of geometry. Wholeness, unity, divine order. The number one. The source of all subsequent shapes. So, that's very significant. You know, people, if you saw a crop circle now, it's just a simple circle, people go, that's rubbish, anyone can do that. I want the big designs. But the simple circle says, in many ways, more than the, the complex ones. Because this is from where everything else comes. And I think it was very significant that the crop circle subject started like this. It was almost as if it had to begin. Something opened up in our consciousness when the first circle was laid down, however it was laid down, and people started to take an interest. People started asking questions. People started researching other phenomena. It opened up other things. It like it opened up a portal. So from then, the whole subject was born. And it's just develop from there and as you go through well this is just a little bit more about the circle this is just interesting background again how ancient philosophers saw it the first the seed the essence the builder 
the foundation, the space producer, and most dramatic, the immutable truth and destiny. The circle implies the mysterious generation from nothing to everything. Amazing. Just from a circle. So a circle is more than just a simple circle. So I still think those are some of the most enigmatic crop circles there's ever been. Those very early ones. And without them, we wouldn't have a subject that we do now. And this is what it developed into things like this, sacred geometry. And this is taking the simple circle a bit further, adding to it. And as you see, the, the one on the left there is a beautiful design, the flower of life. And that is basically just taking the simple circle to the next logical step and, go, and adding to it. And this is what's happened with the crop circle. It has evolved, the crop circle subject, it, it's evolved over time. And uh, it seems to have changed according to our reactions to it. So the, this is where Colin Andrews started to question what was going on, because it was responding to our interaction with it. Okay? I'm not saying that was extraterrestrial or whatever, but there was a consciousness at play with the crop circle world. Once, once people started analysing these simple circles, it started evolving and interacting with our, with our consciousness about it. And it, it was almost like, you know, what we were expecting it to evolve in certain ways or, and certain researchers were asking for certain things to happen or saying, this has never happened or wonder if this will happen. Uh, it's always like this, and whenever anybody thinks they've got the answer, it changed into another form. And uh, as if it was reacting to the researchers. Okay, so there's a couple of quotes here. Every geometric shape has its own energy and specific frequency signature. So it evolved with the designs, and the frequency signatures that were being put down on the Earth was changing too. So that was creating another change in the, uh, in the Earth, in the consciousness field, with all these more advanced designs. And here's a quote you'll like, Nick. <laughs> this is from our own Nick Marchman. Uh, the whole of creation, from the cells in your body to the uh, outer reaches of the galaxies, is governed by the same geometric rules which I think is a great quote because it sums up how important sacred geometry is to not just to us but to everything. Everything comes from this. It's the building blocks of the universe. And the crop circles were sort of showing us the way there. And we've learned so much about it from, from crop circles. Okay, crop circles and stone circles, quite a lot of similarities which often are overlooked. People study uh, crop circles, but quite often don't, don't look at stone circles, they seem as completely separate things. But I see a lot of similarities. There is the geometry of the circle. It is a enclosed space, or a sacred space. When you lay down a crop, you've created a boundary. very much connected to earth and nature and there is an energy matrix within both now this is something I came across by talking to uh, Dowser who was interested in initially interested in stone circles and had doused many stone circles around the country and he says well you can pick up the same energy matrix uh, amongst uh, these st uh, stone circles crossing over and across and even above the stone circle, there seems to be inter overlaid matrix of energies in these stone circles. And it's not surprising that they were seen as sacred spaces and they had ceremonies and all kinds of things uh, took place there. Because they were empowered with energy. And he then did the same dousing techniques on crop circles and found exactly the same uh, energy matrix which was interesting so whether that was intentional 
by the makers of the circle, uh, the circles, or whether that just came about because of the geometry or something else, we don't know. But it shares that uh, commonality with it. They're both associated with unusual phenomena like balls of light and um, otherworldly entities. Often a place of ceremony and meditation. Crop circles are used for, for things like that as well. And there is this connection with spirit. Okay, so I'm going to look at that now in terms of crop circles. So these are all photos taken in or around crop circles that have balls of light there. And as I said before, I believe the balls of light are very much connected to spirit or ancient ancestors, possibly other dimensional beings. But you frequently see them in and around crop circles. Now, uh, I took the bottom left and top right on there. They were taken in daytime and I couldn't see those balls of light at the time. I don't know if you can see on there but there is a bright light there and uh, that one is up there. Um, I couldn't see anything at the time just taking various po photos. I've got two pictures of this one at the bottom left. Two pictures identical. One has that in it and one doesn't. So it was it was there one one second and gone the next and um, the one on the top left was you can you can't see it very clearly there but it actually is in a crop circle I was in the crop circle at the time and that we were doing a night watch and there was a crop circle close by we visited that and then a friend of mine Andrew Perker who took that took this and again we couldn't see it physically at the time but when we looked at the photo we saw that weird Thing there, which actually looks like about three or four balls of light around a central point, and there's this other thing sticking out of it. Can you see that? Can you see that? Now, I don't know what that is. Some people have said, Well, it's a rod, something like that, or other people have suggested, Well, it's just insects caught in the light. It could be either, but it's an unusual photograph. And it was just all seemed to happen at the same time when we when we took that again right over the crop circle, right in the centre of the crop circle, I think. Are they visible to the eye? No, no, not at the time. No. And but the one on the bottom right was that was one uh, taken by someone who was in the crop circle at the time. I've enlarged it there, and they saw this amber ball of light drift over the side of the crop circle. And um, and then it came down at the other end of the crop circle, and they were in it, at, you know, in, in night time. And then the the crop started moving around, rustling and making a lot of noise. Uh, I don't know if it was related to the ball of light, but it may well have had something to do with it. But they then legged it out of there. It scared the living daylights out of them. So. That was an interesting experience, and uh, again, I've heard of things like that happening to other people as well. So there is this interaction with this spirit energy, whatever it may be. So they do seem to take an interest in the crop circles. And we talked about beings, spirit entities. Now this was an interesting uh, couple of photos here. Um, this is, was from a documentary, and, and there's a lot of um, a lot of people around the crop circle world report seeing these black figures, which are non-physical. Okay, some people recall, re, um, refer to them as uh, shadow entities, something like that. And you can see in this top one, just there, there is a figure. You can't see it so clearly here. But there's also one there next to a group of people. It's not so clear what that is on, on that there, yeah, but I'll show you close up in a sec. That's a, an enlargement of this one here. Now I, I've known a number of people who have seen these things close up, very close up on, on occasions, and uh, they do seem to have a bit of a menacing presence. And I've known people being chased out of fields chased out of crop circles by these. Usually they appear at night. 
Um, I've not known anybody being physically harmed, but they seem to create a lot of fear and terror. And uh, people have fled from them, and they, see, they seem to have a bit of an ominous presence. So, when people talk about spirits, spirit entities and crop circles, we imagine beings of light and, you know, all nice things. But it's not always like that. And again, sometimes to get to the bottom of what's going on here, we've got to look at this as well and say, what, you know, what is going on? It's not just the positive elements to this. You put down a nice beautiful crop circle and expect it to be filled with love and light, but we're getting these black entities filling it with fear. So there's some, some element there we don't fully understand. So, again, we have to just confront this and say, well, that is one of the facts about this. We have to deal with it and see what we can learn from it. But uh, yeah, that's the, the other one closer up. That's the black figure there. That's a group of people in the crop circle. So why does it all happen around Wiltshire and in England? Well, as I've mentioned before, uh, Wiltshire is a place of lots of ancient history. And crop circles often interact with that ancient history. And, I mean, just look at the design in that, how it all just touches the edges of, of these um, ancient burial sites. So those kind of bits of magic uh, are happening in crop circles. And it interacts like that. And we'll talk more about that uh, shortly. Uh, also, a proliferation of ley lines, dragon lines, however you want to describe them in that area. Some key land lines, ley, ley lines running through the area. And you also got uh, a chalk aquifer, one of the world's largest chalk aquifers right beneath virtually the whole of Wiltshire, which is providing, I would say, energy through the water aspect of it. So water is a conductor of, of energy and I think there's quite possibly a link there. Certainly there's a link with earth energy. So earth energy is very very powerful in the Wiltshire area and I would suggest that's the major reason why the crop circles are happening there and why circle makers, whoever they are, are being attracted to those areas. Okay, um, how are we doing for time, by the way? I lose all track of time when I'm doing this, so if I'm running that out of time, tell me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Crop circles share the same magic ingredients with many ancient enigmatic structures, such as pyramids. And I would suggest these m magic ingredients are spirit, earth, and human energy. Oh, okay. Well, great. All right. So let's just explore some of that. Just relating it to the pyramid of Giza, uh, earth energy. And we've talked about how <coughs> earth energy plays a part in, in crop circles and how it produces a certain magic. In this structure, it's quite phenomenal, the, the correlation with, with the earth and how it tunes in to the earth energy. Its base and height has been calculated to be a, a 1 in 43,200 mathematical representation of the northern hemisphere of the earth. Okay. If you take the dimensions, it works out virtually exactly to those proportions. So whoever built it knew about the dimensions of the Earth. Its location is at the exact centre of the Earth's landmass. Lucky, lucky guess, obviously. <laughs> it's perfectly orientated to the four points of the compass, the four cardinal points, within a very, very small <coughs> um, error but it's you know if you were just building it putting a building up like that you wouldn't go to that length 
of perfection unless that was important. So that was done quite deliberately. And whoever did it knew exactly what they were doing. It sits almost precisely on the 30th parallel, the 30 degrees. Built over an existing primordial mound, which is said to be where all life on earth began. And it resonates on a frequency of 8.1 hertz, the keynote of Mother Earth. You know, we, people have picked up, up this frequency on sound equipment, and that is the, the, the note that the, the Earth itself has. So it was like it was tuned to that vibration. So it's harnessing Earth energy, it's flowing through it. So it is so linked with Earth energy, this. And it is probably the the most enigmatic building ever built. And it, it's similar to Wiltshire. Giza is on top of a, an aquifer, a limestone aquifer. has that water connection. And we find, when you look at ancient megalithic sites all over the world, there is usually some unusual geology, uh, often um, water-based geology underneath the uh, those structures, that seems to act as... Um, and concentrates the electromagnetic fluctuations of the Earth. So again, the builders of these these things seem to know what they were doing and where they were putting it. Uh, in terms of spirit energy, I would say that the pyramid has fantastic connection with spirit energy. Now this this is a depiction of it with the capstone, which was said, said to be a celestial stone, perhaps made of uh, crystal, and um, just a little bit about it here. This is an idea that's been uh, put forward. Was the Great Pyramid built from the top down using a celestial stone of unknown or supernatural origin as the capstone? Because uh, that was what gave it the angles, the 52 degree angles, and it produced that shape which seems to resonate. Um, particularly at those those degrees it seems um, so where did that capstone come from well it's we know it's disappeared now it obviously was such a prized possession at one time and it was fought over I believe but um, I would suggest rather than extraterrestrial it could be a portal link here and um, this has come through in some form from another dimension. It was just known as celestial capstone of supernatural origin. So you can put what interpretation you want on that, but I would say that was my idea, that I think it must have come through a, um, a portal site. And I would suggest that where Giza is, the pyramid, uh, Great Pyramid, and the way it's designed, it is designed to act as a portal. Uh, and just to give you a little bit more background to that, the uh, the whole pyramid wasn't built as a tomb. That is complete nonsense as far as I'm concerned. There's no evidence to suggest it was a tomb. It was actually, I would suggest, designed more to do with this, which is um, a meeting with God. And those rituals would take place that would take people literally to another dimension. And the, the Book of the Dead implied that the chamber of the open tomb, otherwise known as the King's Chamber, was the doorway between the material world and the spirit world. The initiation pro process into the ancient mysteries based on reenacting the original death and resurrection of Osiris ritual took place with this. It culminated in a meeting with God in the chamber of the open tomb. The initiates would lie in the open coffer in an induced death trance. And the pyramid shape elevated the initiates' consciousness to a higher, um, to a heightened state. So, and it in induced a temporary death experience. So basically what was happening there, they were literally having an out-of-body experience and traversing other dimensions. And and then coming back with that 
and they were never the same person again. So I believe if the ancient Egyptians were, were doing this and that was seen as a key principle of the pyramids, it is something, a direction I would suggest we need to be moving in, in, in terms of developing to the next level. Okay, so just coming back to crop circles again. All right, okay, a few more people waking up there. Would you see those nice pictures? <laughs> okay, so what is your gut feeling when you look at these? They're not from? Not, not handmade. Okay, not man made. Anybody else want to give a gut reaction? DNA. DNA, yeah. That, well, that is, a, yeah. It's meant to be uh, a DNA, a, 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 a reproduction of a, the DNA double helix, yeah. It's, it's simple but complex. Simple but complex. complex yes. Okay. Um, one thing I don't do, I don't go into interpreting individual crop circles, okay? Because there's a lot of people do that, and a lot of it is complete nonsense. Uh, to be honest and there's no guarantee that you can get it right there's so many different interpretations on any one particular circle other than what it feels like to you so that's why I would say what is your gut reaction to that you know I don't believe there is a uh, certain message saying you must do this or you mustn't do that or do more of that it's it's about what it, how it resonates with you but I don't go into that in too much detail because I, I think it, the, the subject is not about individual crop circles, it's about the whole thing, the whole message of what it's all about. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot more t to be discussed on this. So, what I would ask you then, people can't do that, can they? Not everybody could do that, but now this is this is the crux of the argument for a lot of people. Now I'd say don't get bogged down with this element of it. A lot of people do, but that is not what this subject is about, as you'll discover. Okay, so this is what people say when they look at something like that. People can't do that, can they? Mm. Funnily enough, they say the same thing about that. Yeah. People say the same yeah. thing about the pyramids. They can't. People can't make those, no, but they, they did. <laughs> they tried to make the Japanese. Well, whether in we can do it now or not is another thing. But well, that's my view. Okay, yeah. I would say there is no evidence that. They were done from extraterrestrials. Uh, they were done by people. But whoever did it obviously knew a thing or two that we didn't. Well, we don't. Okay? So, just going to have a look at a few things now to do with the human energy because this is the key part of it. Uh, okay. The human energy. The human element to all of this is, is so important. Now, don't switch off. <laughs> okay? Because this is actually... It's where some people start, their heads start to drop. I think, oh... But it actually is the most important part of it. Okay. Colin Andrews has been researching crop circles since 1983. And, as I say, he's changed his opinions on crop circles progressively as evidence has emerged and I admire that okay and he says until we embrace the act of human circle making we are passive observers in a mysterious phenomenon we're just sort of watching and going ooh we couldn't do that but you recognise that humans have a part in this and it suddenly gets more interesting. When we welcome the input of crop artists into the magic, we complete the circle. We come face to face with a deeper dialogue. 
and at that moment we accept the power of the human consciousness to create and influence reality. That's such an important passage, okay? Because by ignoring this element, we're ignoring so much that is important about this subject, okay? Because there is a human element to this, and it is much bigger than people think it is. And we're just going to explore some of that now. Dr. Simeon Hind was another person with an open mind that didn't dismiss this out of hand. We came to realize in his research that the whole premise that we were working to was wrong and that man-made crop circles could generate some sort of change in the energetic field. Now just to put that into uh, context, he was analyzing crop circles using uh, uh, equipment that reads the energy fields and they've done lots of tests and um, analysis of formations over a number of years and they've taken very high readings on some of these crop circles which were thought at the time to be not man-made. The original uh, phenomena, if you like, the, the genuine article and he was saying because these readings are so high in these circles it's impossible that they could be made by people because they're changing the energetic field. Then Matthew Williams who was a well-known circle maker said to him well look you come and watch us make a crop circle bring your equipment and see what happens and he did that and there was other members of the press there as well other researchers that went and watched Matthew Williams and his team make a formation in front of their eyes and they'd taken readings in the field before this happened and then they measured them after they'd made, it, made the circle and the readings were off the scale. Suddenly, by laying down those shapes, it had changed the energetic reading. And Simeon Hyde was scratching his head saying, how is this possible? You know, he's a, he's a scientist, you know, and he's all, it just doesn't make sense. How could it change just from those guys doing that? They haven't used any equipment, they haven't used any sort of energy themselves, they're just using boards, stamping it down. How could that be possible? So it, it changed his views on that. And Matthew Williams was saying there was another researcher there at the same time that refused to accept this <laughs> and still went away and reported nothing happened. This is, how, this is what happens in the crop circle <coughs> world. And they refused to acknowledge this. Simeon Hine no, made a note of this and followed that line. Because he says, as he says here, it didn't fit with what we thought. But that means it's actually something bigger and better than what we thought. And he went off on that route, and then he was ostracized by the whole crop circle research community, straight after that. Same as Colin Andrews was. Anyone that talks about this stuff is ostracized from the whole community. And they don't get to speak at these conferences, they don't get their books promoted, all these kind of things. So there's a, there certainly is an agenda to keep this information away from the public. This is Michael Glickman, who is a well-known crop circle researcher, and he has some strong views on human circle makers. This is what he said. They are people who I would not offer a cup of tea to in my house, in my home. They are uniquely of a certain type, disaffected young men, often from disturbed family backgrounds. They often don't have real jobs. They are the thieves of joy. <laughs> okay, and he's describing some of the people that made those crop circles that you were all in awe of just a moment ago. This is the common view of anyone that makes crop circles, uh, that they are like this. And that was my view a few years ago. I thought they were all the genuine thing. I thought there was an extraterrestrial connection. I believed all of that until I went deeper into the research and still I ta started talking to the people involved in it started talking to researchers like Colin Andrew started talking to circle makers and that's when my world opened up I spoke to one or two circle makers and boom suddenly you got the whole picture everything made sense but you don't get to hear their story anywhere else 
you go to these crop circle conferences, they will not talk about the crop circle maker's story. They will say things like this. They're just little shits that mess up everything for everyone else and ignore them. But people, researchers, have been making a lot of money on their backs, off their backs. Um, whether at the time they didn't know this, I, I'm not, I don't know, but I'm absolutely convinced now that most researchers that you're aware of are very familiar with circle makers and they know the story, they know what's going on. This is the, one of the most annoying things about crop circle research. They know what's going on but they won't tell you. Okay, there's so much lying to the public goes on, you know, and I can see that firsthand now. So be very careful about who you listen to in this in this area, especially if they're making a lot of money from uh, from doing it. Who are the circle makers then? Well, this is one of them, Julian Richardson. He is a phenomenal circle maker. He is a genius. And he's, he, he made this design, by the way. Um, but there's some of the ones that uh, he has made that he won't publicly admit to because they're, they're quite well known. And he, there's still a chance he could be prosecuted for them if he admits to those. So he doesn't publicly say which ones he made. Uh, so he says, by understand the symbolic relationship uh, between uh, sacred design and its position within the ancient landscape, my art has the ability to enter the viewer's psyche and affect how they interpret the world around them. So that's where he's coming from. And um, so he's not just a hoaxer doing it for a laugh after a few beers and things like that. He's, he takes it seriously and, and, and sees it as a, a serious art. Following on from stonemakers of old, I am effectively create, attempting to create sacred spaces for contemplation a catalyst by which visitors can question life, the universe, and their place within it. And isn't that what's been going on with crop circles? Yeah, that was the whole point of them doing this kind of thing. And it has opened up so many new areas for people. Whether it's aliens or whether it's people doing this, you go into a crop circle, you have an experience, you start questioning things, asking questions about life, the universe, and everything. And uh, whoever made it doesn't matter. It's the, the, pr the process that we went through to get there. Is that impressive? Could people do that? Well, he did. Julian Richard Richardson did that just a few weeks ago on a beach in Breen, I think it is. And. Uh, that shows his, the level of skill that he's got, and there are 1,000 circles there. Can I ask how long it took him to do that? It's, it's right here. This is, this is directly from him. I'll read it to you. This piece of sand, uh, sand art was 263, 263 feet across, which is the same size as an average crop circle, and was made with approximately 1,000 circles and created by two people during the spring and summer months in the UK uh, there are between four and a half and seven hours of darkness each day. By increasing the number of experienced people in the team it's perfectly possible to create large complex crop circles in one night and, and that's a guy that should know because he's done it. Okay, And I can, I can tell you now without pinpointing exactly which crop circles he's made I can guarantee you've seen some of his pictures his crop circle on pictures and looked at them in awe because he's a genius and he does things like this he's now doing sand art he stopped making crop circles because he was fed up with being hounded by researchers being called a criminal he wanted to just express his art and uh, he sees himself as a land artist so that's just a little bit of background to one circle make and there's some of his other creations are also on the beaches do you see a similarity? Crop circles? All done in the same amount of time, in the same way. Except the only difference is he uses a rake rather than a, a board stomper. Okay, so crop circles and high strangeness events. This is this is really interesting. 
Okay, so circle makers, people will say, well, if it's people doing it, why would they do it? They're doing it because they're having experiences in the field and it's cre you know, creating some interaction. Time distortions, people have reported um, time either seeming elongated or shortened. According, I've even experienced that in a crop circle that I visited. Time seemed massively shorter than it should have been. Encounters with dark shadow entities, we've mentioned those, or other entities, lots of ex uh, experiences of that. Sightings and encounters of balls of light, many occasions that happens, they see them around them while they're in the, in the circles making them. Flashes of light, just <laughs> lighting up the whole field for no apparent reason. Nobody knows what that is or where it comes from, but it uh, is often reported by circle makers. Bizarre synchronicities, this is something that happens all the time. That uh, things like two teams will be making the same circle, with very similar designs in different locations on the same night, and only the next day do they say, oh, what happened there? Or <coughs> there may be one team, uh, one story I know, there was a team had two designs on the paper, they couldn't decide which one to make, so they decided to make design A, they made, made design A, the next morning they they found out that design B had, had been made by another team on the adjoining field, just over the brow of the hill, uh, and they cannot explain that. It was man, they were both man-made, but they can't explain how that was going on, what was the synchronicity there, what kind of communication was going on. Weather anomalies, unexplained fog banks that shield circle makers. People have said, how come we haven't seen them? I mean, there's even been night watches where, where there's been uh, researchers on a hill looking over, overlooking a field, and a team of circle makers have gone in the field and made a circle right under their noses. And then um, they couldn't understand why they'd not been seen. Matthew Williams tells this story, that they just had this feeling, this gut feeling that they should make this circle. It had to be done. <laughs> and they risked being caught <coughs> but then they found out the following day that the researchers looking at them on the hill couldn't see them because a bank of fog had shielded them they couldn't see the fog from within the within the circle but the researchers did see it weird things like this happen almost as if these things are meant to be there's things that are happening to make it happen but as I keep saying the human element is important okay these circles may have a purpose in being put on the land but it's nothing to do with extraterrestrials it's to do with human human consciousness unexplained urges and compulsions to go out and make a formation just getting a feeling I need to do this and many circle makers will tell you that they just sit and sitting there doing watching TV or something and suddenly they feel compelled to go out and make a crop circle and either they'll do it on their own or they'll get a team together and just go and do it on the spur of the moment. Unexplained moments of inspiration for the designs as well. So people say, well, how did they come up with that? You know, it's, but you know, when you're connected in the right way, these things happen. Okay, so lots and lots of strange things going on. And in terms of connection, this is John Keel again. And he, when he was analysing phenomena and how, what the common elements were in weird phenomena occurring. It says when specific individuals with latent active psychic abilities are in specific places at specific times, the phenomenon is able to manifest itself in one of its many forms. And I would say crop circles is one of its many forms, which wasn't around then, but certain key elements are in place. Key individuals, key people, like we're going back to the skull experiment, certain individuals had to be there for it all to work. With crop circles, certain crop circle makers had to be in this place in Wiltshire at a certain time to make it all happen. All the elements coming together, the earth, the spirit connection, all of those things suddenly make something magical happen. So, yes, sometimes these things that occur, we look at them and we say, well, wow, that's impossible people could do that. Circle makers might even look at it and go, God, yeah, I can't believe I did that because there's an el another element sort of takes over 
it's almost like they're being channeled in some way and this inspiration is flowing through them and it happens and uh, some, maybe if you ask them to just reproduce that near, here and now they might not be able to do it to the same standard because something else is going on so this is what everyone everyone wants to believe is something else something an extraterrestrial or something coming um, to do this give us messages I wanted to believe for a long time and I'm not saying I don't believe in extraterrestrials by the way because I get shot down <laughs> for things like this saying of course there's a aliens and extraterrestrials I believe there are yes and I've seen a UFO uh, but um, that's not what the crop circle uh, crop circle subjects is about I believe in humans <laughs> Okay, we've got to start believing in ourselves a lot more. Instead of saying, humans can't do this, people can't do this, of course they can. Okay, we can do amazing things. And it's only by believing in ourselves and thinking about what we are actually capable of that we will actually reach our full potential. So, here we are. Let's start believing. In us. So, are we, how are we doing for time? Are we over? <laughs> All right. Okay. We we'll speed through the last bits. The magic ingredients for crop circles. Then, spirit energy from ancient ancestors, entities from other dimensional realms. Earth energy, living crops, sacred landscape, ley lines, dragon lines ancient and sacred sites all plays a part and the human energy from the circle makers themselves ancient ancestors ancient and sacred sites and researchers enthusiasts all add their element to it and this creates a new creative energy fueled by the collective consciousness Okay, side effects include synchronicity, changes in the energy field, and sightings of unusual phenomena. Okay, so all this magic happens, and we are at the centre of it. Now, I'm not saying that there's, a, you know, n all crop circles are man-made by any means. There, there may still be elements of the unexplained, and particularly maybe going right back to the beginning, those simple circles. I would say there's still yes question marks over how they got there, but I can pretty much guarantee that. All the complex ones are man-made. Has the message of the crop circles then been to reconnect humans with spirit, with the earth, and with the rest of humanity? All flowing through collective consciousness. Okay, so we we start to put all those parts into place, and we can do amazing things. The sacred trinity, and maybe you can connect with our own true brilliance. And yes, I do believe that was made by people people who are much more connected than we are. Okay, people that were connected with the earth, and we've seen that, and connected with spirit, and we've seen how that takes place as well. So, what they were doing thousands of years ago is what we should be doing right now if we really want to evolve to the next level and just to look at some other um, anomalies connected with the ancients that's the um, the open coffer in the king's chamber as it's called it's carved out one single piece of granite and thousands of years ago we didn't have the tools to get right into those corners and <coughs> make right angle corners exactly like that but whoever did it managed to do that and again Egyptologists can't explain that and uh, we couldn't even do that today I don't think and things like this from around the world you know this is Cusco in Peru amazing technology and, and using massive megalithic stones here so that how did they do these with the stones all over the world different places we've got uh, Russia 
Easter Island and Baalbek in Lebanon. You look at the sizes of some of these stones here, you're talking 100 tons, well, so several hundred tons I should say. 700 tons I think was reported for, for this one here, 1000 tons some of them. We can't move things like that, and well, why is it halfway up a wall? Okay, these ancients knew how to do these things. It wasn't extraterrestrials. Humans built these things, and however they did it, they knew how to move stone of massive weights, and they obviously wanted it of that size for some reason, maybe for the energy conductor. Uh, otherwise, why not just break it up into many pieces, which is what we would have done. So it was important that they did it, and you see the same thing all over the world. Not just in, in Egypt, but many places all around the world using these massive blocks of stone. This is a place I came across recently, Kailasa Temple in India. And all of that is carved out of one single piece of stone, carved out of the mountain. It's um, an incredible feat. You have to have that dedication and that connection to earth and spirit to be able to do that to that degree. Now just coming up more up to date, these are some modern things people do when they start to connect a little bit more with, with nature, with spirit. And we can do the seemingly impossible things. This is a thing called um, gravity glue, which is, uh, I think, is incredible and beautiful as well. And um, this is the guy that does some of those things. It's, again, those kind of things seem impossible, but they're not. When you know how, when you work with the right energies, you have the right balance of energies, and you know how to work with, with nature. This guy, Simon Beck, did all these on snow, just by walking over the snow. Yeah, so what seems impossible to us, you know, is surprisingly simple when you, when you look at it from another angle. And this is very similar to crop circles. So this is just a quote from Max Planck, the originator of quantum theory. Science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature because in the last analysis we ourselves are part of the mystery that we're trying to solve. So you can't take the people, the humans, out of the equation. We are part of this bigger picture. And by, so by denying that, we're, we're, we're just going to limit ourselves. <coughs> so what is the secret to all this? It's not the secret. <laughs> so humanity were all united in the knowledge of its creative power. The seemingly impossible could easily be manifested. Everything is connected. We are one and many. Perception is reality. We have to help our fellows to realise their power to manifest a better world. So it's collectively, collective consciousness is what really the law of attraction is about for me. Reconnecting with spirit. This is where we need to go. Energy vibrations can be raised by meditation. Simple things we can do. Psychics, healers, experienced meditators are known to have a higher body energy than, than average. And this can be passed on. Uh, and also things like the healing arts will also increase body voltage and uh, passing on or receiving healing. Reconnecting to the earth. Okay, there's been a lot of talk of that uh, this weekend, which is great. It's great to be a place like this, and you do feel that connection to the earth. This is a, an interesting quote, and I think this is something that a lot of people need to think about as well. Not necessarily people here. If you lose touch with nature, you lose touch with humanity. If there's no relationship with nature, then you become a killer. And you kill animals for sport, food, for knowledge then nature is frightened of you, withdrawing its beauty. And I think this is an important point to make that often people forget about, our connection with animals. You may take walks in the woods or camp in the lovely places, but you are a killer and so lose the friendship. That's saying if you don't have that bond with animals as well, we are still disconnected from nature. And I think too many people now still 
eating meat when we don't need to. Okay? I'm not here to preach veganism or vegetarianism to you, but if you think about it, do we need to eat meat? If we don't, why are we doing it? <laughs> um, so, I would say that's a good place to start in forming, reforming that connection to the earth. And I think the, the world would be a different place if we did. Human energy, spirit energy and earth energy all goes together to make a collective consciousness. And that equals unlimited human potential. Okay, so if we combine with all those things together, using the, the magic ingredients, we have unlimited potential. But we have to start making those changes. Okay, just to finish, uh, there's a nice quote here. I thought it just just sums up exactly what I'm talking about. There is a vast spiritual awakening in progress in our world, quietly and soulfully. Many are returning to the truth of who we are, seeing the futility of the world's ego ways. If you surrender to this call from within, it may lead to a deeper questioning of the way we do things. There will be surely moments of loneliness where you feel that you no longer belong. But if you stay in peace and follow the call, your soul will begin to see truth in a deeper way. The remembrance of perfection. <coughs> this truth is the only freedom there really is. And its power is beyond anything the world can offer. It is your power. It can move mountains. It can heal you. And it can heal the world. Okay. So... I think that's a good point to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Have we got any time?